You may be seated. If our ushers would come, we'll prepare to receive our morning tithe and offering. This week I read something that kind of fit in to where we're at as far as our commitment to God. It says, giving is not a matter of what you have as much as a matter of who has your heart. That kind of rang a bell with me. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you that today we are recipients of so many blessings. We've sang about them. We've already thought about them. We recognize that just being here today is a blessing that you have given to us, and we thank you for that. We pray that as we share this morning in this tithe and offering time, that you would bless both the gift and the giver. May we accomplish in this body of believers all that you want us to do with your resources that you give to us. We thank you for this morning service. We pray that you would be with each of us here, and also we pray that you would be with Pastor Susie today. May your presence and may your leadership guide her as she leads those that she's ministering to. We pray, Lord, that you would also be with Joden as he shares your word. We pray that you would anoint him, give him words this morning that we need to hear, that will touch our lives, that will help us to grow. Help us this morning that this day would be a great day for us. May it be a time that we draw closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hello, good morning, everyone. Everyone look to your neighbor and just give him a high five. I saw you back there, Nikki. Tell him I'm glad you're here this morning. That's all right. I have a couple announcements before I really get started. Uh, the first one is today is the, is the last Sunday to sign up for our chili dessert cook-off. 
which is next Sunday. So if you look in your bulletin, those papers are still there. Uh, today is the last day to do that. So make sure you get signed. I know a lot of people have texted me and emailed me or Annette. Uh, just make sure you put that on paper so I don't forget about you. So and turn that in. Uh, if you haven't already, that's okay. Just give it to me after the service. Uh, we'll be good. And uh, my second announcement is I totally forgot, so I'm not going to even announce it because I forgot what it was. But again, I am so glad to be with you guys this morning. Uh, it's actually really funny because in two days, uh, the 15th is when I accepted the job as uh, the youth and recreation pastor here. And it's been super awesome to be with you guys since January. And I think I've done a good job. I hope you guys can do this, say the same. But uh, it's been really cool. Oh, thank you. <laughs> It's been really cool to, uh, to be here uh, and watch these students grow uh, and be in community with you guys. So I'm so thankful for uh, you guys bringing me in to do that. And so uh, Susie's gone today, and so she put her trust in me to come uh, and preach to you guys. Uh, I like to call this big church. So I've been telling everyone, yeah, I'm preaching in big church. And so uh, super excited. Um, I want to start with saying uh, it's really funny. Uh, as I was preparing my sermon, I was thinking, uh, it's super funny, like, I go back um, and I watch, like, movies and I do things uh, that I did as a child, and I notice things that I didn't notice when I was a child. And so it's like I'm, like, using my, like, adult brain. Like, Annette always tells me, you know, men don't really grow their brain until they're, like, 28 is what she always says. But, I, I like, I truly believe it because, like, I notice things that I didn't notice as a child, like, Interesting. And so, um, again, like as we grow up, we develop like, you know, these tastes uh, that we never had as a child. For instance, like I never liked uh, carrots as a child. And but now I've really developed a really taste for carrots. I like to get my carrots and dip them in some ranch. It's really good. And so while I still like, you know, don't like coffee, I've really developed this like deep enjoyment uh, going to Oncue and getting like the like the largest uh, fountain drink of Coke Zero. Uh, I just really like that. I don't like coffee. Oh yeah, I see you back there. Yeah, I really love me a good old Coke Zero from Oncue. It's like my absolute favorite. Uh, but those are all somewhat you know expected taste developments. But sometimes we are surprised by the things that we develop interest in as we grow older. And so, for instance, as a child, I never really was interested in like comic books or superheroes. Uh, I was like that ESPN child, like I would sit in front of the TV, watch every sport channel, you know, 30 for 30s, like that was my childhood growing up. And so it wasn't until high school where I really started to dabble in uh, my, so what called now, my superhero obsession. And so uh, I had seen, you know, a couple of, you know, the Avengers movies and some of the Batman movies, but not all of them. And so it wasn't until my freshman year of college when I really got hooked on superheroes. And so first, you know, Spider-Man, like the OG Spider-Man, Tobey Maguire. And then, you know, it was The Flash and then Super uh, Superman. And so these, super, these superhero stories have developed this very important place in, Amer uh, in American culture. And so they resonate with our desire to make the world a better place. And so... I truly believe that, you know, these stories gives us hope that the good guys will win, uh, despite the best efforts of the bad guys. Uh, and I always see, you know, children aspire to be like those heroes, uh, even wanted to dress like them, uh, hoping that one day they might, they might be asked to save the world. And so as I think about, you know, all those, you know, great heroes, there are, very, there are lesser superheroes in our culture history as well. And so, you know, these guys are not given, like, you know, this extra special power, you know, like, you know, Spider-Man, Spider-Sense, or, you know, the Batman gadgets, or Captain America strength, but they develop their natural skills in order to make a difference in their world. And so, again, while these legendary, you know, fictional characters, these lesser superheroes remind us that the real people can make a difference in the world, Sometimes the line between history and legend is kind of blurred. And so whether or not they were, you know, historic figures, uh, it's not as important as the fact that, you know, they could have been. And so I think of people like, you know, Robin Hood, uh, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table and the Lone Ranger. 
But one of my favorite lesser superheroes is Zorro. Has anyone seen that movie, Zorro? Every, yes, okay, all right, awesome. Uh, you know, he was that sword-wielding bandit who fought against New Spain for the rights of California peasants during uh, the early 1800s. And so uh, this film, The Mask of Zorro, some of you guys said you've seen it, uh, was, in, uh, was made in 1998. And so the opening scene is like, you know, this squadron of Spanish soldiers coming to a village to execute uh, randomly selected and very innocent citizens as a display of power over the California peasants. And so there is like this huge crowd of villagers just kind of standing around doing absolutely nothing. And so why? And because they, I feel like the why is because they're all thinking, to each other, do you think Zorro will come? Or will Zorro come and save the day? And sure enough, if you've seen the movie, Zorro shows up and uh, it's one man, he takes on all 40 of these soldiers and the massive crowd was there you know, with a few expectations. They, they're just standing around doing nothing. And so I talked about, well, before I say that, I guess they were doing something. They're all cheering and, you know, which I, I'm sure was very helpful, them cheering, you know, uh, Zorro on. But uh, as I mentioned earlier, I went back, I watched this movie as a child, and I went back and I watched it, uh, it was probably about a year ago I watched this movie again, and I, I'm just thinking to myself with my adult brain, why are these people just standing around doing nothing? Like, why didn't they, you know, help out and pitch in to help Zorro? You know, why didn't they do anything in the first place? And so I think, you know, perhaps... You know, they were scared. You know, they were like, ah, this isn't my place. Or, you know, they were lazy. Um, and again, they probably, they probably was just thinking, like, we're not heroes. Like, Zorro's going to come save the day. And so that's an, awful, that's an awful lot like the picture that's painted in 1 Samuel 17. And so I'm going to do something different today. You, I was going to read the scripture, but I want you guys to open your Bibles if you brought them. And I, I just, I'm going to spend a few minutes, and I just want you guys to just skim through that. It's 1 Samuel chapter 17, uh, and I just want you to read that chapter. We're going to take a few minutes, uh, just skim through that, uh, get the basic knowledge of what's going on. All right, if you're still reading, you can go ahead and continue reading, but I'm going to paraphrase uh, the Joden Jackson translation. So basically, this is a story of David and Goliath. And so what's happening is there's these soldiers here, uh, this army here uh, at this you know, campsite, and you have the, the army, the, the enemy across, and they have this champion, uh, Goliath, this huge guy, you know, and everyone is just afraid. And then uh, some... The story goes along, and, you know, they're trying to, Goliath is calling people out. No one wants to come. And then you have this little boy, David, a little shepherd boy, uh, comes and basically takes on uh, this giant, Goliath, and he ends up, you know, defeating him. And so uh, that was a little paraphrase. I skipped some parts, but that's okay. I'll go over them. And so, again, here we have these grown men, these grown soldiers standing around looking at each other, wondering what they're going to do about Goliath. And so, again, with my adult mind, I'm thinking, all these soldiers against this one big guy, okay, all right, I understand. We're just going to stand around and do nothing. And so nobody, nobody steps up to fight Goliath. And so they're either, again, afraid or they just figured, ah, this is not my job. And so even 
even the offer of great rewards from the king's treasury is not enough to entice any of these soldiers to go and fight Goliath. I mean, if the king was offering me something, I think I'm going to go out there and give it my best shot. But that's all right. I understand. And so, again, maybe they're sitting there and they're just waiting for a hero. And so the Israelites were used to having, you know, the spirit anointed hero step in, you know, in the last moments and save them. Uh, I mean, we look at the, the book of Judges, you know, this gives us a little taste of some great, you know, superheroes. You know, Ea, the left-handed man who, you know, smuggled a knife into the presence of the overweight king, Eglon. And then you got Shamar, who killed 600 Philistines with an ox god. And then Jael, the wife of Heber, who killed the enemy commander by driving a tent stake through his head. And then you have Gideon, who led 300 men to victory against tens of thousands of Midianites and, uh, and, and so on. And, you know, I think about, you know, Samson, whose strength led to the defeats of thousands of Philistines. And so perhaps they were just waiting for another one of those spirit-filled judges to come and defeat Goliath. And so finally, a little later in the story, again, the hero appears. And this is, a, again, a, in, in the form of a little boy, with a shepherd's staff, a sling, and five stones. And so, again, they try to talk him out of it. It wasn't like, hey, this is our hero. No, they try to talk him out of it. Uh, they try to dress him up in the king's armor and give him a fighting chance against Goliath. But David reminds them that he does not put his trust in chariots, horses, armor, swords, spears, or javelins, but that he, tr- he puts his trust in the name of the Lord his God. Amen? And so, that little shepherd boy goes out and does what he does best. He, he gets that rock and he throws it and pegs that really big, ugly giant right in the forehead. And so, again, I, I really sit and as I read this, I, I, I try to imagine what was happening in the Israelite camp each morning for the past 40 days leading up to this. Uh, you know, did King Saul call in, you know, all of his leaders for a conference? They're sitting around the table trying to make a plan, you know, that the, that the army come around and, you know, they have a little band and they had a pep rally and they're like, all right, let's go. We're going to go get them. And then they're like, oh, no, we're not going to do it. You know, did a new item get added to the list of, you know, treasures each day that the king was promising? Um, did King Saul, like, hope that uh, a hero would just step out of the ranks and go and fight Goliath? And none of those things happened. And so, the men started chanting the name of the soldier that they thought uh, was best able to go defeat Goliath. Again, wasn't happening. And after they got themselves all worked up and excited, what happened then? Nothing changed. And they continued as before. Uh, Goliath taunting and jeering them, the, you know, the soldiers being very cowardly and hoping that, again, someone else would come and step up to the plate and take care of the problem. And so oftentimes, we hope that someone else will do what God has called us to do. Uh, We fear, you know, the lack of qualifications or the ability, or perhaps, you know, someone else can go and do it better. We busy ourselves with the things we want to do and simply assume that someone else will do the needs that needs to be done. And so sometimes we wait to be asked, when we know that God has already asked us to do it. And so we tend to think to ourselves, oh, well, you know, someone else can do a better job reaching our neighbor or, you know, family member with the gospel. Someone else is a better musician or a singer or a speaker than me. Someone else is better suited to, you know, lead a small group, whatever the case may be. You know, sometimes our waiting for a hero manifests itself as an individual sin, disobeying God's call in our lives. And sometimes the church is guilty of the corporate sin of simply hoping that a hero will come in and solve all the problems. We put our hope in, you know, programs and speakers and and, and a pastor, and we fall in love with this idea of revival, as long as it doesn't mean nothing has to change for me personally. I, I often see so many churches bring in, you know, special speakers to simply get them all worked up and excited But when that speaker goes away, so does that excitement. It wasn't revival that they wanted. It was the idea of revival that they wanted. And so we're happy to get all stirred up as long as we don't have to be changed. We love to hear, you know, this good fiery sermon as long as it's directed at someone else. We love to be inspired, 
but not so inspired that we have to step out of our comfort zone and go and do something about it. And so I'm reminded of these old worship songs, you know, take me, mold me, use me, fill me. I give my life to the potter's hand. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Let my hands perform his bitings. Let my feet run uh, run in his ways. Let my eyes see Jesus only. Let my lips speak forth his praise, all for Jesus, all for Jesus. And so those words are so easy to sing. They really are, but they're harder to put into action. And so, again, after all, we would much rather have a a superhero come and just take care of the problems for us. And so someone else will go and invite kids to VBS. Maybe there's someone else that will, you know, give the church uh, this month, give to the church this month in my place. Someone else will volunteer for this event. You know, we've been very, very blessed at this church. I truly believe LVP is one of the best churches that I've been at. And people are willing to, you know, pitch in their time and resources to do whatever needs to be done. But I really know some churches, I was talking to Janice about this last week, but 20% of the people doing 80% of the work. But again, that's not what happens here at Lakeview Park. We make it happen, and I'm super thankful for that. I mean, we have over, I think, like 12 people signed up for the chili dessert cook-off like next Sunday. Like, that's awesome. I love how we just dive in and we get things going. But yet the story of David is really a good reminder that it doesn't take people with a lot of skill and talent to build the kingdom. It doesn't. And battles are not won by, you know, mighty warriors up front. And God doesn't always choose, you know, the rich and handsome, even though I think I'm very handsome, absolutely. Or, you know, someone power, powerful to do his work. You know, more often he chooses simple, simple people like you and I to take whatever we do best and use it for him. And after all, God used a shepherd boy who knew how to throw rocks. And so just as God asked Moses, as he stood by the burning bush, What's that you have in your hand? I can use it. He asked David the same thing, and he asked you and I the same thing. What do you have in your hands? Give it to me. I can use it. But I want to take a little different turn. On the other hand, heroes can also be very dangerous things. And after all, they keep us from doing the things we are supposed to do. So who needs to fight Goliath, you know, if you know, Iron Man will come in and save the day. Why bother fighting, you know, those Spanish soldiers when, you know, Zorro will come riding in on a tornado and take on all 40 of those men with, you know, a single sword? Why get involved fighting injustice when, you know, Superman is just a speeding bullet away? You know, this little shepherd boy David reminds us that we don't need super uh, superhuman powers to do God's work. He reminds us that, you know, armor, swords, spears, and javelins aren't the tools that God asks us to work with. David reminds that instead of turning around waiting for a hero to arrive, we ought to jump in and find out what God wants us to do. And then, guess what? We go and do it. And so we don't need a hero if that hero is only going to do things that we ought to be doing ourselves. And so... I think I think one of the main reasons why I love superheroes and the stories that they tell is because it reminds me of the only superhero this world has ever had. And that's Jesus. And the real reason why I love superheroes is not so much because, you know, I inspired to be one, but because they remind uh, remind that uh, reminds us that our ultimate hero is Jesus Christ. Man, I don't think you guys are hearing me this morning. Like, our ultimate hero is Jesus Christ. Amen? And I believe that the reason, you know, these superhero stories are so uh, popular in our culture today is because they are retelling the greatest narrative of all, the divine narrative. From woven into this fiber of our our being as a longing to hear and rehear the, the story of Jesus. The greatest works of literature in all of history are those that tell the divine narrative in one form or another. And so as I watch these superhero stories, I am amazed at these people of power, you know, that sacrifice that power in their lives in order to save ones, you know, that they love. And they remind me of the great love and the, and the Savior. That, it reminds me of the great love that the Savior has for me. And as I see them stand up, you know, for the hopeless cause, I'm reminded that, you know, Jesus intercedes on my behalf. The greatest hopeless cause of all. 
And as I see them, as I see them defeat, you know, these villains and do these things, I'm reminded that Jesus has defeated Satan for all of eternity. There's this line in a super in a Superman film that, you know, sticks out to me every time I watch it. And it's, you know, it's Superman. He's rebuking uh, Lois Lane for something that she wrote in her prize winning article. And it, it was entitled, you know, why the world doesn't need Superman. And, you know, he takes her up in the clouds, you know, fire up there. And he says to her, you know, I hear, he said, you wrote that the world doesn't need a savior, but every day I hear people crying for one. And so the fact is that the world does need a savior. They, they don't need, you know, Gideon to wage war against the Midianites, nor do they need, you know, Sanson to collapse the building that, you know, hosts in like this Philistine party. Uh, neither do they need, you know, a David to throw a rock at Goliath. But what the world needs is a savior who can provide salvation for our sins. And the good news is this, is that the savior has already been providing 2,000 years ago when he died for us. And it wasn't in, you know, a sword-wielding bandit named Zorro, not a man from outer space named Superman, and, you know, not, not through the spidey sense Peter Parker, but through Jesus Christ, a little boy born to die a criminal's death for us. And so Jesus was born into this world for one reason, and that was to save God's peoples from their sins. And so from what we really need is to be freed from our sin, for it is our sins that keeps us separated from God, holding us in bondage and in slavery. And the sin is what Jesus, our ultimate hero, came to save us from so that we could once again have a relationship with God. You know, Jesus lived this perfect life among us, showing us how to live and how to love. And he loved us so much that he died on the cross, the perfect sacrifice for our own sins. His blood washing away every stain. And to demonstrate that he defeated death, hell, and the grave, Jesus rose again from the dead on the third day to offer us eternal life. Michael, what a hero, right? What a hero. The band, you guys can come on up. You know, this morning as we close, I want to encourage you two things. Uh, encourage you with two things. And one, that is do what God has called you to do. Do what God has called you to do. You know, if that's, you know, leading a small group, uh, singing with the praise band, you know, being involved with youth ministry. I'm always looking for volunteers. You know, whatever it is, be obedient and do it. Do what God has called you to do. And then my second is Jesus is our ultimate hero. Think about that for a second. Jesus is our ultimate hero. Which means he can do anything for us. That's through the valleys and on the mountains. He's there with us because he is our ultimate hero. This morning we're going to sing this song uh, as we close. And I just want you guys to respond how you want to respond. If that's coming to the altar, sitting in your chair, whatever the case may be. I want you to really just reflect on what we just talked about this morning. Have you let Jesus come in and rescue you and free you from sin? Are you letting God use you completely and not waiting for someone else to come and do the job that he's called you to do? And think about it. Is Jesus your ultimate hero? Is Jesus your ultimate hero? We're just going to just sit and reflect on that, and the band's going to sing. And then I'll come back up and close this out. Again, I'm not a, a long speaker. I like to, you know, keep it short and simple. But, again, think about those two things. Has Jesus came and freed you from sin? Are you letting God use you completely? And is Jesus your ultimate hero? Let's sing.
us pray. Um, God, we are so thankful that you are for us. God, that you are our ultimate hero, that we can put our faith and our trust in you, God. God, I pray as we leave this place today that we are reminded of that. That you're good, God. Father, as we as we go through our week, uh, just be with us. Be with us as, you know, we're at home with our families, we're at work, at school, whatever the case may be, God. Um, that we can always just feel your presence with us. Father, again, I'm very thankful for this church and the things that you're doing through us. God, um, just continue again to be with us. Father, we love you and we praise you. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, I love you guys. I hope you guys have a great afternoon. You get a a little longer lunch.